thank you for joining us today. Hey, Diana, thank you so much for having me. Grateful to be here. I am grateful to have you because you have gone through and safe to say, continue to go through your own journey with endometriosis, a saga, really. I feel like even once you get the diagnosis and perhaps you have an excision surgery, it's not just said and done and it's behind you. For some people, sure. For me, that hasn't been my experience. I know reading your post and and watching your podcast that that hasn't been the case for you. Um, and I feel like your story is really informative and very powerful and helpful. So again, we appreciate you being here. So let's just jump right into your journey with endometriosis. Whew. <laughs> Where to begin? No, I mean, I'm sure people have heard me speak before, you know, I have, I, I talk about really, it started at an early age for me. And I didn't know very similar to a lot of people who suffer from this condition, but you know, I had the painful cramps. I thought it was normal and not just painful, like killer. I remember in high school, rocking back and forth in pain, you know, wrapped up around the toilet, like just really thought that that was normal and, and saw my doctor and was told it was normal. And I think I was given, um, naproxen sodium, which is like a leave and not even birth control in the beginning. It was just like, this is normal. You just are one of those people. So I just, I lived with it, you know, through middle school, I would say is when it really started all the way through high school. And you know, I had people question me. I remember I would be like sweating and so sick and my poor dad, but I have to call him out. I mean, there was a time where he was like, are you on drugs? Like he legitimately asked me that when I was in high school, because I was just, I, I was kind of like out of my mind when I was like on my first, second, third day of my cycle, because I was so pale, I couldn't eat, you know, and I was rocking, literally writhing. And that's how much pain I was in. And I was lucky that I had my grandmother who had also gone through this, but told me, you know, this is just, you're just one of those people. You have to suffer through this. I'm so sorry. And, you know, here's a hot water bottle. This is what you need to do to manage it. And so I just learned how to manage and, and I found a regimen that worked enough to get me to do what I needed to do, which was copious amounts of ibuprofen. You know, I just stayed on this cycle where I, I tracked it on my phone. Um, I don't think we had iPhones then. no, we didn't have iPhones and we did not have phones. We didn't have cell phones. So I must've, I must've kept it in like a notebook where I knew every like four to six hours, like do not let the pain start again, because if you do, you're done. So like, I just got on. And this was just you self-diagnosing, not really knowing what you had, just knowing that you had yeah. to find your own treatment. Of yes. This, yes. Of this. Yeah. Thought, thought this was normal. So that was like how I managed all through high school, but what really started to like red flag that started to alert me that something was wrong was in my earlier twenties. Um, I was at work and you know, I was a, a general manager of a retail store. And so it's a lot of standing and running around and, but I was in my young twenties and I was just starting to feel nauseous and not well. And my friends were like going out and having fun. And I was just like, I can't, and not even paying attention. Really. I was literally just eating like saltine crackers and broth because my stomach hurt so much all the time. But again, just kind of pushed it to the side and was like, Oh, something's going on. But I really thought that I had like an ulcer or something. I re I didn't know, you know? Yeah. And so yeah. started to go down this path of, um, seeing GI doctors and I got all the G like every GI test under the Definitely sun. Definitely had IBS, right? Yeah. I mean, doesn't, I feel like That's so what many of us get diagnosed with IBS, which as Dr. Sachin once said on a medical conference is BS <laughs> with endo at least. 100%. Yeah. And that's, you know, that diagnosis actually helped me get to my endo diagnosis, which I do think is sometimes common, right? Because mm -hmm. you, you get this diagnosis. So I had all the tests and then of course went back and sat down with the, this GI doctor. And he was like, IBS take like Nexium or whatever, like the pink pill and buy. And I was just like, I knew in my gut, uh -huh, no pun intended, but I knew I was like, no, like, no, this is not IBS. Like I was Googling and just trying to figure out like IBS, what does it mean? What is it? And, and it must've been down, like who knows on the Google search, this is in the early two thousands. 
and I saw the word endometriosis and I just started reading about it and was like, oh my gosh, like every sign and symptom. And I wish I remember that website because it really changed my life. I don't know what it was. Mm -hmm. I think it was actually like a, a NIH like study or something like that, that correlated IBS and endometriosis. So I immediately called my OBGYN and was like, uh, I think I have endometriosis. Like we need to have a meeting. And so I came into the office, I told her, and she was like, let's send you for an ultrasound. Of course I had multiple cysts on my ovary, mm -hmm. hence probably being in all this pain and nausea and just losing weight like crazy. And, um, she said, let's do a surgery and to diagnose it and get this cyst out of your ovary. Mm -hmm. Now, I, of course I was very nervous. I had never had surgery before. And this part of the story, I haven't shared a lot, um, she came in and she seemed a little disheveled and I was terrified. Right. I was, I think I was 23 and I was like, are you okay? Like I'm asking my doctor, are you okay? And she's like, my mother passed away last week. And I was like, we don't have to do this. Like I'm off this table. Like I don't need to do the surgery. She's like, no, it's fine. I'll, it'll be fine. So I was just literally a huge nervous wreck going into that surgery. The outcome was I had endometriosis. She didn't know how to stage or anything like that. It was just her quote unquote words were, I've never seen anything that bad in my life. That's what she said. And she said, we're just going to put you on continuous birth control. And so I listened and that's what I did. I had no idea what anything meant. I didn't go research it probably the way that I should have and just went on the continuous birth control, which I will say helped with the pain, but it didn't help with the hormone situation. So yeah. then I was just like, all over the place. Like I was super emotional all the time. I wasn't feeling right. And I was like, I can't do this. Like, this is not for me. I tried multiple. It wasn't like I gave up after a month. I tried this one. I tried that one. Same. Yeah. yeah. As I'm sure many people, mm -hmm. you know, and I know many people who have endo have gone through that same type of scenario. And so tried all, and I try, I really did. I think I gave it like a year of trying and That's trying to figure try. out. Yeah. And, and we kept switching them. And so then I was just a mess, right? Like just hormones were like a roller coaster in that time. And for your youngsters out there, this was before Facebook. So I started to do research and I found a chat board, like back in the day before Facebook, there were things that were chat boards, kind of like Reddit. Um, and I found a chat board specifically about endometriosis and I live in Michigan and I happened to find another person in Michigan who also had endometriosis and she became just such a helpful, I mean, the chat boards were very helpful too. That's where I learned about excision surgery and how I learned about like just the pain and it not being normal and the other organs it could affect. And my yeah. mind was blown. Like I was just like, I, so at that point I was like, okay, I need to save every, I think I was 24 working retail, like working crazy retail hours. And I was like, I have to figure this out because I, you know, I'm the manager and there were times in the back of the store, literally in the manager's office, laying on the floor. I mean, it's just unacceptable. It was just, it became this thing where I was sick every day at that point. Like, yeah, yeah. it wasn't my cycle. So, you know, I always tell people in the beginning, like, for me, it started with very painful cramps. Then it moved to more of like stomach issues. And then it was just chronic pain, stomach issues, just a general feeling of what I call like the endo flu, where I was just fatigued, felt like I was sick all the time. And I was trying to like live a life of a 23, 24 year old. All my friends are like going to the bars and stuff. And, you know, I'm like, I work retail, like I'm already exhausted by the end of every day. And I, I knew at that point, like, this must be more serious than I anticipated because all my friends are able to do all of these things and they're working just as much as I am, but I can't keep up. And so that's when I decided to travel and have my first excision surgery. And so I had that surgery. It, I was diagnosed with stage four endometriosis. Um, at that point, it took me multiple years to really realize what that meant. Um, I don't think I really understood that this was like a chronic condition, even though I had read that it was, but yeah. at that point, um, I was very excited to talk to a doctor that understood what I was going through and had the surgery. I think it was four and a half hours long and, you know, traveled home. And when I got home, I actually 
was, got really sick and started to get hives on the back of my legs. And I was like, that's really weird. It, it, maybe it's a reaction to one of these like medications. So we ended up having to go to the ER because I had a fever and hives. And in the ER, of course, they were like, oh, it's probably a, a UTI. Uh, no ease is a UTI. <laughs> Everything's always a UTI when you have endo. Um, it's not funny, but you have to laugh about yeah. it or you'll literally yeah. go crazy. Um, it was, and so they gave me like an antibiotic or something. And then by the next day, the hives had spread over my entire body and I'm taking this and it's not working. And by the following day, the third day, my whole body was frozen and my hands had so many hives on them. I couldn't even like, I had zero dexterity. I like, I couldn't lift anything. My husband had to lift me out of bed and I, I went and saw my family doctor. I didn't know, like, what do you do? Yeah. Come to find out later. Thank goodness. I went to my family doctor who literally got out a book and was like looking through it. And she's like, you're having a reaction to something. You're either having, maybe you caught something on the plane or you're having some sort of reaction. Well, years later, I found out that the type of sealant that they used after my surgery was called flow seal, which nobody uses that any longer because so many people had reactions to it. I don't know for sure, but we're pretty sure that when that was used after my surgery to prevent scar tissue and adhesion, that I had a, a major allergic reaction to it. So it almost killed me because it actually was, Terrifying. the allergic reaction was shutting down my body. My joint stopped Internally. working. Yes. Internally. So yes. what, how, can I ask how they managed that? A uh, crazy diet or crazy um, amount of steroids. I was on steroids for over 30 days. And so it was, I'm sure people have taken steroids before, you mm -hmm. know, it's that pack, but I was taking like 20 pills, 19, eight in. So high, high, high dosage of steroids to get through that. So you can only imagine after having my first excision surgery to have that happen afterwards, Perfect. that recovery was really intense. I, you know, I was like, oh, I'll take two weeks off work. I mean, I think I ended up being off for 12 weeks after that working retail, I couldn't go back to working retail. And thank goodness the company that I worked for was so supportive and so amazing that they helped to find me something in the office, which oh, was incredible. Incredible. Yeah. I mean, I did end up going back to the store. So, but that was like just kind of my first experience with all of this and surgery. And it was, it was pretty intense. Um, when you say stage four, that usually, I mean, that's deep infiltrating endometriosis. Many of the times that becomes extra pelvic. So for you, did you have anything around your bowels? Because with the or anything that would cause or adhesions um, that would cause stomach issues or anything that would kind of mimic flu-like symptoms. Cause I always, I'm obviously not a doctor, but I'm always confused, right? Like we have this chronic illness, but I sometimes am in shock when I think I've made it over a hurdle or things are better. And then it almost seems like, bam, it's back with a vengeance. Yes. And the symptoms are not always, some symptoms stay, but then some symptoms change and they're yes. new to me. And I'm also doing the Google search and going to the family doctor, because I feel like the family doctor just sometimes will really be more of a diagnostic and try to rule everything out. Yep. Um, but I know for me, like I, I now have new symptoms of indigestion and like nausea that's extreme for like three weeks out of the month. And then for a month I'm fine. And it's just like, what is going on? And it seems to track along my cycle every time. But like you said, it carries over more than just like a few days before the period. Um, yes. So what, I wanna, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, 100%, like I, I totally understand what you're saying too. It's very hard to keep track because the symptoms change and they adjust and some weeks you feel fine. And it really is, is, is very challenging to figure all of that out. So yeah, I, I, I agree with you. There was no, to answer your question at that time. And I wish again, reflecting yeah. now, I wish I knew what I knew now. I knew then I had no idea about the bowel potential. It was never talked about. My appendix was removed because there was disease on the appendix and mm -hmm. that was it. Um, about a year later, I was back in the same amount of pain and I was just so frustrated because I was like, what am I supposed to do? I called that doctor and the doctor was like, come back. We let's check it out. Um, when I went back, I had another surgery. And during that surgery, they said the adhesions were, were horrible and almost as bad as what the endo was. And I was like, 
as we reflect back, when I talk about that allergic reaction, that that's probably what happened. Yeah. So, yeah. so and I did have to, she was so painful, so painful. And I literally just felt the exact same. And I was like, I saved like every penny, you know, one thing that's like an elephant in the room that people don't talk about is the, the cost for endometriosis care, the ongoing care. If you have to travel, you know, and I'm so grateful that I was able to, that I had a job and I was able to save that money and be able to, to be able to afford to do that. I'm very, very lucky because there's a lot of people who are not in that position that can do that. So that, you know, that surgery happened and the quick fast forward, just because the story is so long, but I don't want to take up all the time with that story so we can have more time to have questions. But, um, after that, I was good for several years. I kept growing and shrinking cysts. Like I just kept getting cysts, big cysts, small cysts. I ended up having one. I think that was around 10 centimeters. So finally I did have to have surgery, which I just did locally here, um, where I was told the doctor did excision, but he really didn't when I asked him, you know, but I wasn't really thinking this was an endo surgery. This was, we got to get this cyst out of my ovary at that time. It was my left ovary. And that was several years, that was probably like five or six years after my excision surgery, where I still, after that surgery had very painful cycles and nausea and intermittent, you know, issues still definitely going on, but I was better. I definitely was better, but the cysts kept coming and going. And those are, are just as challenging sometimes in my opinion as, as having the disease. So he ended up removing my left ovary in that surgery. Um, because the cyst was so large and he said the entire ovary was damaged. It must've been there for se- for several months or who knows how long it was there. So, um, in that surgery, they, they did see endometriosis in that surgery. He said he removed it. Um, but after that surgery, I, I was good for, I mean, good. Like I didn't have a surgical procedure for several years and I really changed, started to change my my life. Like I changed my diet. I changed, I tried to change my lifestyle to not be as busy, which is still challenging. (laughs) And, and I still just had, I just knew like I planned my life. It was like being in high school again. Like it was, it was not as bad, but I would have what I would call episodes where I would want to go to the ER, but know that the doctors wouldn't be able to help me there, but would be, you know, just laying on the floor, rocking back and forth and just again, I came up with ways to, to manage it. And it was mostly just taking way too much, probably ibuprofen for so many years. Um, and that, that's what I did for, for a really long time. And then in 2017, I knew in my gut, something was wrong because I was struggling to eat again. Uh, I ignored it for a long time. Um, I think I was about 15 pounds down when I decided I needed to probably address what was going on called that, called my previous doctor who had helped me. And that doctor was like, I think it's time for a hysterectomy. And I was just like, I'm not ready. And so I didn't, I I didn't end up, I I made the appointment and then I got nervous and just canceled it and was like, I can live with this. It's fine. And then through serendipitous ways, I met another doctor, um, and met with that doctor. And that doctor was like, "I, I think you, you don't need to have that done right now. Let's, let's try and be a little more conservative, but still try and help you out. So in 2018, I had surgery again. Um, and my endo was back to stage four Mm -hmm. and I ended up having uh, an emergency bowel. I had almost a full bowel obstruction. Mm -hmm. So they ended up having, because I, I, I had the nausea and everything, but they thought it was because I had another big cyst and it, it wasn't, right. I wasn't presenting as much as like a bowel case. So we, we had someone on call, but we weren't like, Oh, this is going to be a big bowel surgery. We weren't really planned for that. And, um, when the doctor came out and talked to my husband, he said that my bowel looked like a balloon animal because it was strangled in endometriosis tissue. So I did have to have a portion of my bowel removed in that surgery and we were not prepared for me to be spending um, seven days in the hospital after that surgery. So that was a life-changing surgery. Um, it was very intense. And I think I'm still probably recovering from it. Um, I, I just, my stomach, I, I'm just, I haven't been really the same. That was a really, really hard surgery on my body, yeah. as well as removing stage four endo. I think that was a seven or eight hour surgery. Yes. Um, so that was a really, really intense, 
uh, surgery in 2018. And then I just, you know, I got better and my cycles were amazing. They were pain-free, which was great. But after a couple, like a year and a half or so, I just started to, to not feel Ugh. right again. I know. <laughs> it's crazy. I just, it's... Yeah. And I had another large cyst. Like I just, my body, I don't know what it is. I think they just, it's just like, let's grow some more big cysts that have to be surgically removed. Like they don't go away. Um, and they're not small, they're large and you can't leave those in because they're a risk. No, cause yeah, you could, you could have torsion. You could. Yeah. yeah. And so I it's ended up rougher. having another surgery in 2020, but the positive, I know it's, it's crazy, but I'm feeling so much better now. I am struggling a little bit with something going out with my kidney. I do. If you ask me right now, I, I think it probably is probably from surgery, so many surgeries, probably something endo related because, you know, endo is covered when you said extra pelvic. Now we can get to this point. I've had it. I've, I've had it in every yeah. part of my pelvis. It is, there is not a, a stone unturned that endo hasn't really attacked in my entire pelvis. So everything, my ureters, my bladder, my bowel, um, my uterus, my ovaries, everything. I think the only thing knock on wood is I haven't had the diaphragmatic, even though I do sometimes get the pain in my rib. Mm -hmm. Um, it has not been found there. So, um, my doctor sometimes jokes in a light hurting, loving way that if there was a five, that I would be classified as a stage five, because I just have very severe disease and it's just, it's very aggressive. And so that's why I appreciate being on here. And I appreciate being able to tell my story. Has it been easy? No, but I, if I don't tell my story to try and help other people or post about on social media or, or my podcast, I feel like then all of this suffering is not worth it. Yeah. So that's why, that's why I do these things, but it's been an incredibly hard journey. Oh yeah. And I mean, when you think about the human body and how frail it really is and yet resilient at the same time, but just the mental toll, oh. I think the, when, when people say, oh, well, you're probably a pro at needles now and this and that, you know, with all the surgeries. And I said, in fact, it's gone opposite. I used to be more stoic and now it's like, I will jump off of a table because I know what's coming. Yes. You know what yes. could happen and you know what just the experience is like and what you feel like after. And it's just like, I wince at the thought of an IV. Um, oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's, there's such a multifaceted way that endo impacts an individual. And the idea of like having to advocate for yourself, be your own doctor, be your own mm -hmm. researcher, be your own scientist. Then, and then outside of this, you have a life right? you have a whole life, you have a career, you have your dreams, you have your family, you have your goals and endo just gets itself right in the middle. And like adhesions just kind of cl like globs onto everything and yes. mucks it up. Yes. Um, and it's like this idea that we hear of like endo strong endo warriors. It's like, I go back to who wants to fight this much in life. Life is hard as it is, but you also want to enjoy it. And when your own body is not working with you, because there is this chronic insidious disease that does not have a cure in sight or even really, I don't even want to say easy treatment options, but surgery is not an option for so many reasons. Yeah. You mentioned to hearken back to the price. I mean, insurance, even if you pay the doctor's fee, there's so many other things that pop up. Mm -hmm. There are people that are, you know, I fought for having to explain why I needed, um, a urologist involved in my surgery because my kidneys were about to fail from endo adhesions around the ureters, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. and they didn't want to cover it. And there's so many people that deal with this because endometriosis is still looked at in a very small lens yes. as a reproductive illness, instead of how it can impact the organs, how it can cause bowel obstructions, how those bowel obstructions could actually lead to someone losing not only portions of their bowel, their quality of life, but also someone could die from that. Someone could die from losing their kidney function. And we have to stop looking and classifying endometriosis as a benign reproductive disease because that is, I'm going to say it is a myth. It's a lie. It's not accurate. Let's trade in the facts. Yeah. I, I, 
I, the doc, I was the person in the hospital that every resident had to come see. And I didn't understand the severity of what had happened with my bowel until I literally was like 20 people were coming into my room because they had never seen anything like this before. And they were surprised that I was functioning on a daily basis, that I was alive because my job had me on a plane every other week, my bowel could have ruptured and I would be dead. I would be dead. Mm -hmm. Like. And would they even know at that point that it that was, was from endo? No, that's the whole thing. And, and I'm getting fired up because I hear your story and it's like, not only do I want to reach over and give you a giant hug, but I also am just like, what the hell, man? Like, why is this not getting more serious attention? I mean, thank God for the endo community and for how we all rally around each other and yeah. for the amazing practitioners and doctors and researchers that do realize there is, there needs to be a call to action and a change, but this needs to hit bigger. Um, yeah. We just, you know, I, I hate the expression I deserve or we deserve because in life, like nothing's really ever justified or fair, but hell yeah, we deserve, we deserve a treatment option that, that is actually not going under the knife that is actually not having to go under general anesthesia or bankrupt us. And uh, the, you know, surgery after surgery, so many risks, so many things. And every time you go under those adhesions that you spoke about, those surgical adhesions are so, so painful and many times can cause their own complications yeah. and own kinds of obstructions. So we just got to do better. And because of your voice in the community, your podcast, what you've been doing throughout several years, being an advocate, that's how we're going to make change is people like you. So again, Melissa, thank you for being here, thank for you. being, you know, truly a warrior for all of us. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. And I, you know, I agree with you. We even need to even take it back to more of a basic, just the general awareness. It's, it is much better than it was when I started going down this path, but it's still not to the place where, where it is. And, you know, you talk about the mental health part of it and all of that. How many, how, how many friends of yours still are like almost roll their eyes when you cancel plans? Like, yeah. I, they, they understand more because I'm so outspoken, but I still think there's a part of them that is kind of like, Oh, Melissa's sick again. And that is so hurtful. Of course, I want to be at your party or this dinner, or uh, you think I'd rather be laying on my couch, like pretending to be sick. No, of <laughs> course. I, I would much rather be out and doing that. So like even just the basic awareness of how severe it is. Right. And when, yes. when people say I have diabetes or when people say I have whatever, Right. We all, oh, we understand what that means, but, but with endo, it's not, there's so much education and we're already exhausted because we're tired because we don't feel good. Most of the time we have to spend hours trying to make doctor's appointments and seeing all of these different doctors and people just don't understand how extremely challenging it is when you're yes. already dealing with not feeling well and, and how chronic and severe it really is. I still personally, and this is something mentally that I need to work on. I always think like after surgery, I'm fine. I'm going to be great. And it's not the case. Like it's, it's, it's not like, this is a chronic illness that I have to manage. Right. Yeah. No, I'm in the same. I think, I think sometimes the delusion is what gets me through the reality. Yeah. Me too. And it's because if you look at it any other way, it's like, it's like a ticking time bomb and you're thinking, okay is it going to happen today? Is it going to happen tomorrow? Like, when am I going to feel that way? Um, well, yeah. the constant fear. I don't know if you live like this, but I, I really try to not, but when you have a pain or an ache or something and you're like, what is that? And that happens to me often. And I have to make sure that I like keep myself mm -hmm. in a good like frame, like don't over, you know, don't overthink this pain. It could go away, but it's just, you know, and then when you have this like kind of stabbing pain, you're like, oh my gosh, like I, how can I get through this again? Like, I just don't know if I can do it. Yep. I always do the like brush it off and just like, oh, this is going to pass. This is going to work itself out. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, okay, this is happening every single month, but maybe it'll work itself out. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. And yeah. And then I'm just like more turmeric and more. <laughs> Where's the ginger tea, the, ginger tea, the yeah. lattes and the turmeric yeah. capsules and yeah, everything is turmeric. Um, yes. you know, yes. it's like whatever you can do. I'm like, you know, 
people said, oh, do Pilates, relax your body, relax your mind. And it's like, oh, it's just not that. <laughs> so no, I, I hear you. And there's so much more to discuss. And I hope that you'll come back and talk with us again. I'd love to. Thank you. Thank you.